May God be with you. Well, welcome to spring. It looks a lot like winter. Um, on these dreary mornings, I'm thankful that for the spirit that gathers us together and breathes life um, into us as the body of Christ. So whether you are here in person or online, we are grateful that you are here, and we hope you can take a breath and feel God's presence around you and the care of one another this morning. It is the third Sunday in Easter, and this morning we are starting a preaching series on the book of Acts um, for the remaining season, season of Easter. And Acts, as you know, is the sequel to the Gospel of Luke, and that's the um, book we've been dwelling in this year. And we probably don't dwell in the story of Acts enough and the life of the early church. So spoiler alert, the church wasn't perfect back then either. Um, but these early witnesses to the risen Christ help us spark our imagination for our church and our life together. Um, finally, uh, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and we give thanks for the open-heartedness of Jason Kiebelbeck last week as he shared his own story at the intersection of faith and mental health. And during the time we would normally do the Apostles' Creed today, um, we give thanks for Rich Holloway, our Director of Youth and Family Formation, who has an important story to share as well. So with that, welcome again to, uh, to Mount Olivet. Please stand as you are able for the Thanksgiving for Baptism. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who saves, creates, and sends us with love that lives forever. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we give thanks for the mercy and forgiveness that wrap our true selves in sacred belonging and purpose. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. For a word at the dawn of creation, which, which spoke water and life into being. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. For the great flood that revealed nature's power and God's commitment to life after death. Thanks be to God. For the river that carried Moses safely, building a bridge between mothers and nations. Thanks be to God, alleluia, for the rock split open in the desert, spilling water for those thirsting for freedom. Thanks be to God, alleluia. For the one who turned water to wine and met a woman at the well with living water. Thanks be to God, alleluia, for the gift of holy baptism, which declares there are no more God-forsaken places and nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus, for Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. God of life, we rejoice with the waters that cover creation. Our songs of praise echo their dancing tides and streams. Pour out your Holy Spirit on this community and all of creation. Cleanse our fears, drown our divisions. Give us mercy and grace to drink so that our whole lives are signs of death defeated and thirst quenched. Thanks to the risen Jesus, the Son of God. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
us pray. God of resurrection, remind us that your Holy Spirit is among us as we make our way. Help us reveal your love to the people we encounter and in the places we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. A reading from the book of Acts. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen a vision. He has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. So I did a Google search, and the name Saul is ranked 953 on the list of popular baby names so far in 2022. Paul is 253, so this conversion is good. He's moving up on the list. And Ananias was 1,153. And before you feel too badly for him, Beth was ranked 1,253. <laughs> Now, my Bible says this story is the conversion of Saul, but I'm wondering somehow today if we should be a part of renaming it. 
Saul was known as a persecutor of the Christians, and through this miracle story on the road to Damascus that Allison just read to us, he is called to switch directions and now becomes the Apostle Paul, known for spreading the gospel to new ends of the earth. Paul himself is credited for writing a good chunk of the books in the New Testament. But it is not Paul I am taken with today. It's Ananias. He is a disciple we hear in Damascus, living his life, doing his thing, and he gets a nudge from God in a vision. Go find Saul and bless him. My spirit will be made known in your connection. You are a part of his story. Ananias responds, no thanks, God. Paul is scary and clearly not one of us. I'm not available for this volunteer shift. Anything else I can help with? And then God speaks a little bit more clearly. Saul will be an instrument for me. Oh, Ananias says, and he goes. And he walks into a room on State Street with this real evil man who is slumped on the floor, blinded by this whole experience. And Ananias greets him as brother, as part of the family. And his shaking hands are laid on him, trusting that through his presence and his human hands, the Holy Spirit, the one that has been promised to guide this darn world now that Jesus has died and been resurrected, will come. And we hear in the story that something did happen. Paul is given his sight back, now seeing a new way. He eats and he begins proclaiming Jesus. God did not keep this conversion, this new call between God and Saul. He let others in. And so Saul's conversion becomes Ananias' conversion, although we don't know Ananias as well. But for that day, he entered God's unfolding story. And I don't think it's coincidence that this is how the Holy Spirit was revealed through another. Martin Luther, the founder of our Lutheran faith, in an article writes about mutual conversation and consolation of the brothers and sisters. And Luther writes that this is the daily encounters and interactions and mutual sharings with each other. This is where the gospel happens, where the grace-filled good news of our forgiveness is spoken and experiences in our relationships with other people, both known and unknown. And it can happen at home, at work, at school, at play, at church, in your neighborhood, or in these random chance encounters like we heard today. In fact, Luther almost made mutual conversation and consolation a third sacrament because Luther knew how essential it is to have people walking alongside of us in this life, caring and speaking truth and accompanying and participating in faith practices, in bearing burdens, in asking hard questions, in praying, and entering each other's stories and stepping out into places that are so unfamiliar. God's grace is most certainly given at baptism and holy communion, but also in the in-between places. And so God calls us to be bearers of this, to extend this grace, and to be receivers of it from others. God chooses to dwell right there using broken, beautiful people as instruments of God's grace. And so I'm going to pause here and walk away from the pulpit. I have heard stories from you on how this takes place. It can't just be something that Martin Luther thinks about. It has to be something we experience. And so I'm inviting you right now, unprompted, 
to think about a time where this has actually happened to you, where you have given something to someone or entered their story or have said, yes, I will do that. And what happened in that moment is not only did you have something to give, but you also had something to receive. So I know this is last minute, but can anyone think of a situation where that has been real and present in your own life? And I ask you just to raise your hand and speak it. Yeah, Beth. So uh, Beth and Jason McGrew King are foster parents, and Beth just shared that as these um, children who are entering um, the fostering system uh, find Beth and Jason, that Beth and Jason give and nurture and love these little ones, but they are also so transformed by that love. That is mutual conversation and consolation, and it's happening in your house. And it's happening through a county system to somehow place kids with families. Thank you, Beth. Deb. Yeah. So for those of you online, Deb Bergstrand just shared that um, she has elderly neighbors and um, who are kind of in a spot where there's need, and Deb has shown up to offer care to them, but has also received abundantly this sense of gratitude. Um, and for them to offer something to Deb, that mutuality of what that means. Um, so as she gives, she's been fortified along the way. That is mutual conversation and consolation right there. Yeah, Sharon. Hmm. Yeah. So made. So here's May Day, and Sharon's talking. This was probably a little ways back. When you were a young girl, and you would give and bring a May basket to your neighbor, and not only did you give of this May basket, but the neighbor um, gave back in the form of candy um, to Sharon. And um, maybe that was an early example of what that means, that when you give, you also receive. Kathy. Oh, so here's a story of mutual conversation and consolation happening at Mark's work, having a coworker um, who is single, and Mark and Kathy inviting her to be a part of their family events. And now as Caroline gets married next week, uh, she will be a part of their family pictures. The giving and the receiving, Holy Spirit, the ongoing story. How about one more? Barb. Yeah. 
So Barb said yes uh, to going to New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, where Mount Olivet was part of Camp Noah, which is like a vacation Bible school for kids who have been experienced trauma. And Barb said, um, showing up there with children that she had never met before um, and teaching and giving of what she had in that time, but just what she received from those children that she actually felt the Holy Spirit. So there it is in New Orleans. And Barb, you had to say yes to go in order to receive that. Dawn, I saw your hand too. And so Dawn is talking about um, being with a friend who went through chemotherapy and Dawn saying that she was infused with this abundant life in the midst of her friend going through treatment for cancer. Um, as chemicals were put into her body for her healing, Dawn received her healing at a hospital somewhere. So I can sense in this community that you know what I'm talking about and that it's not so much an announcement that gets made about here's the places where we as staff think you should show up. This is about us being open to where we're being called and taking that next step to go and show up there trusting that God will be here as well. And so here at Mount Olivet, we have a hunch that this new life, that this future ahead in the Holy Spirit will be revealed in the exact places that you have articulated today by connecting ourselves to each other. And it's holy work that moves us from some obligation to volunteer to actually knowing that we're part of the story. And what we hear today is that Ananias was an extension of God's grace, and by showing up, he entered Saul's story and helped him emerge into a new call, which led to the gospel being shared to the ends of the earth. And what Paul realized that day is that he could not do this on his own. He needed to be dependent on others. And if you think about it, this mutual conversation and consolation is peppered throughout the Bible. I mean, just go back and think of all the stories that it was through another that God's grace was revealed, that faith was nurtured, that people could hold on for one more day. Job and his three friends, Nathan and David, the widow and Elijah, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, Mary and Elizabeth, Jesus and the Samaritan woman, Naomi and Ruth, the women at the tomb, the road to Emmaus, the focus and call of this life is not to make it on our own. And the world tells us just this, but God says, live it together. And this mutual conversation and consolation can happen in relationships that we have tended for a long time. And it also can happen with relationships along the way. The Holy Spirit is wispy like this, moving and leading and guiding and always promising to be present to connect us with God and each other. And so we're, we'll focus here at Mount Olivet to connect and reconnect, to invest in this sacred work of mutual conversation and consolation. And it was a primary focus of our interviews with Pastor Kristen. And so she's called among us and has great gifts to lead us to create this opportunity for us to show up with each other and for our community. What we will find is the place where you say yes to giving is the place where you will also receive. She's gonna have a listening session on May 18th and other conversations as well to talk about what this can look like and what this can be. This mutuality is that juicy middle of the Venn diagram, the intersection of ourselves and God and others, where we experience this marvel and mystery of a God who is revealed along the way. As we listen to the stories in the book of Acts, we will hear about the daily, the spirit moving and connecting people. 
it is not well planned or precise, but it is how God's story continues to come person by person. We will also hear in every story that the way to connect through God is to pray. And so we will pray about that today. And I'm giving you a little heads up in our prayer time. I'm inviting all of us to speak together the name of someone, and it can be a person or an organization, someone that has impacted your life of faith. And we will pray for them and give thanks for them getting involved, for investing in you. And then we will pray for someone, a person or an organization, where you are feeling called to show up. It doesn't need to happen in a vision like Ananias. Maybe it's something that you're curious about or an invitation or something that you just feel called to. We will pray and have you name that person or organization and we'll pray for the next step, where you are being called and how this will continue to be a part of God's unfolding story. Hear the good news today. We get to be a part of each other's stories and God promises to be revealed, to be, bring abundant life as we do this. So go be an Ananias. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we join together in song.
seated as we welcome Rich Holloway to share with us today. Uh, I think my four-month-old knew I was talking about anxiety today because he was up early. Uh, so, um, have you ever felt that knot uh, in the back of your neck, or a tightness in um, your shoulders that makes sitting uncomfortable, or have you ever felt a pain in your stomach that makes it unsettled. For me, um, I didn't seek help for my anxiety until those things became so common that they were affecting me every single day. At the time, I thought, I thought of anxiety as something everyone had, but it was part of normal life, and it most certainly couldn't possibly show up in my physical health. It wasn't until I sought help from a talk therapist that I started to deconstruct those notions and realize that my mental health is part of my physical health. That anxiety does not have to be a major force in my life, it can actually be managed. And that there is help available in all of that. I still remember the feelings I had the first time I called to make an appointment with a therapist. I was thinking, am I really doing this? This seems like a big overreaction. Doesn't everyone worry? But it was one of the better decisions of my life. Months into talk therapy, I was actually diagnosed with dysthemia. I can't spell it, it's a bunch of whys, but uh, it is essentially a low-level depression that's been with me for most, if not all, my life, probably since childhood. My anxiety is closely tied to my dysthemia. One feeds off the other. What made getting help such a great decision was it gave me language like this to talk about it. Talk about what I was feeling. I learned so much about myself. Why am I feeling this way? And how can I learn coping skills to manage this? For me, Healing has looked like three years of meeting with a therapist, medication, and adopting mindfulness practices every day. And I'm still learning every day. It can be hard to make those first steps and to share with loved ones that you're seeking help for your mental health. I wish I could say all my friends and my family wrapped me in love after I told them about anxiety, but that didn't happen. But for the ones that did, I've gotten so much closer with. They know more about my story, and many of them felt comfortable to share their story with me, even concerns about their own mental health. My hope, my hope is that we sh as we share more of our stories around mental health, we create loving space to hear a fuller picture of, of the ones we love the beautiful perfections and imperfections that make us human. At the heart of Christian community here, for me, is the sense that we are seen, heard, and loved by a God who created us. I have always hoped that my loving communities resemble that God. So if you struggle with anxiety, depression, or any other mental health concern, know that you are not alone. Take the first step to get help, it can be very hard for sure, but let someone know what you are going through. Share your story. And if someone close to you tells you they are experiencing an anxiety disorder, hold their story with tenderness and kindness. They are probably trying to be seen, heard, and loved. Thank you. Thank you, Rich, um, for that offering of um, sacred story and vulnerability and just your humanity um, and how that ripples through this community and um, helps us know that we're all beloved. Um, it's time now um, to share in and offer our 
peace to one another and also to make space for our offering, our offering of our financial gifts, of course, but our lives and our talents and all of the things that Pastor Beth spoke of so well. Um, your offering may be placed in the basket in front or at the Welcome Center. Children, um, you are invited to come up and drop your offering off for um, Lutheran World Hunger in the basket. And it's now time for us to share in the peace. And so and if, if you are online, we want to connect with you, with, with you too. So please um, type in your peace comments into Facebook. Um, and now if you're here, the peace of God be with you. Let us share and receive, receive a sign of God's peace um, with one another.
Let us pray over our offering. God of the resurrection, we give these offerings in gratitude, rejoicing in the abundance of your gifts to us. We give these offerings in faith, trusting that you will provide for our needs. We give these offerings in hope, knowing you can use them to spread your love in this world. With these offerings, we give ourselves. May we live with generous hearts and open hands. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy Lord, God. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and broke it and gave thanks and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Now gathered together by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Give us to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We are reminded today that God is present and calls us into all the little things. In all the little ways we show up for one another, in the daily little ways we grace one another with consolation, with conversation with abiding care. God is here too in our little cup and our little bread. Um, And it doesn't seem like enough, but it is enough and it is abundant. So for those of you who are um, having communion at home, hear these words, the body of Christ is given for you and the blood of Christ is shed for you. And for those of you here in the worship center, Ushers will guide you forward. All wafers are gluten-free. The wine in the cups is red and the juice is light. So come now. Christ is the host of this table and all has been prepared.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Uh, we enter into time of prayer now for our community, for our world, for whatever is going on in your lives. So I will um, open with a short petition, and then I invite you to um, raise your hand with prayer requests that you might have. So let us pray. God, um, you, you break in with a small invitation, with a small call. Um, you break in with a small uh, new way or a, um, an invitation from a friend. You break in, God, and it seems like it's so, these, these ways that you call us are, are too little, but they are big and they, um, and they mean so much in this world. So break in today into our lives. Um, call us into holy work, even work that we don't think can, can matter. Um, break in, use our small graces and our uh, care for one another and help us say yes um, to rely on one another um, and just to be amazed at how it changes us and changes the world. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Um, prayers today also for Ruth Broman, who has pneumonia and is in the hospital. For, for Ruth and for you, Benji, and for your family. 
Um, we pray for excellent care for Ruth, um, for rest and healing and recovery and patience, I assume, um, for the love of this community um, and God to come close to Ruth and her, and her family in these coming days. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. What other um, prayers do we have today? Yeah. Okay, and remind me who's getting married. <laughs> Car Caroline? Okay, and remind me of your name. Kathy. <laughs> uh, prayers for Kathy and her family and her daughter Caroline and her um, wedding this weekend. We just pray for all who will gather that they would be safe in their travels, that they would have a safe time gathering, um, and that Caroline's wedding would be blessed. Uh, God in your mercy hear our prayer. Yes. Okay. Warren? Okay. Um, Al is praying for his brother-in-law, Warren, um, who is, has struggled with cancer over the years um, and now is entering the hospice stage of his journey. God, we, um, we pray that Warren and his family will have sacred time with one another here. Um, may Warren um, feel your presence, God. Um, may he be comfortable and without pain. Um, and may, um, may this time reveal the presence of God in ways that are unexpected. God, in your mercy. Our prayer. I offer some prayers today, too, for Deb Weiss. Her mother, Buela, has entered hospice. Um, and so we pray for this tender and sacred time um, for you, Deb, um, and for your mother and your family. May God come close. Um, and we also... Um, want to lift up the flowers here um, in front um, are from Jean Bristol's funeral from Friday. So we continue to pray for the Bristol family as they grieve the loss of their mom and grandma and for friends of Jean here at church who remember how much she meant to this community of faith. So God in your mercy. All right. So when, we, when I offer this prayer, I just invite you to speak this organization or this person's name. It's going to be messy, this cacophony of, of people in our lives. And so, God, first, we uh, just are mindful. We think about someone who has impacted our life of faith. We give thanks for their presence, that they said, here I am, Lord, and um, for how their story has entered our story. And so, God, um, both online and in person, we speak those names now. One more time. And so um, we, you can tell this hasn't been done before. Um, and so we pray for the person or the organization, God, now. We speak their names. Prayer, God, um, is for us to be open to the places, to the people, to the organizations that we're being called. And so to the best of our ability right now, we speak aloud those places or people where we think we are being called. For this mutual conversation and consolation that you are about in this world and for us to be a part of it. For all these things that we've prayed, amen. So some announcements for you. Sherry Larson has been our intern. Um, we have never had this before. It was new to Luther Seminary that she was in a more rural site in uh, Buffalo and wanted a, a more metro suburban site. And so we've been partnering with Spirit of Joy. Her last Sunday preaching is next weekend. And then she's finishing her coursework. She's going to graduate from Luther Seminary and be open to a call. And so um, I just want us to send her off and uh, with love and appreciation for her great gifts. 
Um, she has worked very hard in her preaching here, and we have just received that gift. And for all that's ahead for Sherry, and uh, we get to be part of Sherry's story, and she's a part of ours. So next Sunday, she'll preach at both services, and the time in between services is just for us to greet her and to check in to see how things are going with her and her husband, Kevin, and all that's next. So um, that is good. Uh, there's a table outside to say thank you. We have so many young people and adults who are guides to little kids and middle kids and high school kids. And uh, the program year is ending within the next week. And so there's cards out there and the names of everyone involved. Even if you want to pick one name and write a little note of appreciation, just to thank them um, for their commitment, especially to kids and family here. It doesn't matter if you have a kid or a grandkid in the program or not. We all are a part of this, and this is just a way we can offer that gratitude to them. We have a new version of our monthly newsletter. It's out on the welcome counter. It's also online. You can pick that up, and it's a picture of outdoor worship, which means um, in the month of May, we will be leaning into a new summer schedule on Memorial Weekend and all the goodness that summer will bring as well. And then uh, thank you to Rich for sharing his story. In the news, we heard that Naomi Judd died of suicide. Um, and just another reminder of um, the darkness of this world and how our minds are so much a part of our health. And so we have a table set out about resources. The number one question we get is, where do I go? What do I do? How do I connect? Um, and it's not always a straight line, as Jason and Rich have shared, but it's being a community of faith, a church where we can talk about this and we can entrust our stories with others that will help us along the way. So I invite you to go and connect with those resources. Mental Health Connect is one of our partners, a consortium of organizations around mental health, which is good. And um, grateful that you're in worship, and I invite you to stand as we sing and close with a hymn. And now may the loving power of God, which raised Jesus from the dead, strengthen you with the spirit and bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace and tell what God has done.
Thanks be to God. Thank you.